John seemed happy to see his family again when he met the Pan American flight at Frankfurt. Mary Jane had sent him a telegram with their arrival time. His mood was a good omen. The next two and a half years were one of the better periods in the marriage, and they were years when his career filled with promise. The U.S. Army in Germany in the mid-1950s was an army that could appreciate a John Van. It was an army on the qui vive, honing itself for the clash with the Russians that every man from general to private was certain would come. The John Van who went to Germany was an officer maturing professionally from the combination of his military and civilian education and lessons learned in the most adverse of circumstances in combat. Performance in an army actually at peace but emotionally at war therefore stood out all the more prominently. His initial assignment on arrival at the 16th Infantry Regiment in June 1954 was to be acting executive officer of a battalion. Then, for a week, he was acting battalion commander. The bold and astonishingly competent way in which he handled himself caught the attention of a man who was to become one of Van's army patrons, Bruce Palmer, Jr., at that time a colonel commanding the regiment. When Palmer needed a new leader for the regiment's 4.2-inch mortar company a couple of weeks later, he chose Van. Heavy Mortar Company, as the unit was called, was the ideal assignment for a captain in an infantry regiment because it was a separate command the closest a captain could get to a lieutenant colonel's job of leading one of the infantry battalions. The 4.2-inch is the biggest of the American mortars. It throws a shell approximately equivalent to an artillery round about two and a half miles. There were 12 mortars in a company. They were carried to position on trucks and served as the regiment's integral artillery. Palmer selected his subordinates carefully. He had shaped the 16th Infantry into the best of the three regiments in the 1st Infantry Division which was stationed in central Germany across the presumed main invasion route of the Soviets from East Germany and Czechoslovakia. Heavy Mortar Company reflected the second-to-none attitude of its commanding officer. Palmer noted on an efficiency report that Van's inclination to discipline his men severely did not interfere with his ability to gain their loyalty, because he drives himself at a terrific pace and expects the same standard of performance from his subordinates. During maneuvers on the plain of Grafenvor near the Czech border, Van had his mortars in position and ready to fire the moment the infantry called for a barrage. The shells landed on target. The mortar fire was meticulously coordinated with that of the artillery. The gun emplacements were so perfect, they could have been used as demonstration models. At inspections in garrison, the weapons and equipment were in faultless condition. The records were kept precisely according to regulation. The appearance of the company commander and his platoon leaders and men was a perfection of spit and polish. The mortar company and its commanding officer also excelled at those other activities that keep an army prepared. The company won more athletic awards than any other in the regimental competitions and contributed members to the regimental basketball team, which Van coached to a victory over the teams from the other two regiments in the 1st Infantry Division Championship. I was particularly impressed with the fighting spirit and will to win evidenced by all members of the team, Palmer said in his letter of commendation to Van. They might have been outplayed at times, but they were never outfought. When Van was transferred to headquarters U.S. Army Europe at Heidelberg in June 1955, after a year with the regiment, he had been promoted to major that April, Palmer went out of his way to alert future promotion boards and selection boards for schooling to Van's potential. He rated Van on a final efficiency report as one of the few highly outstanding officers I know. Palmer urged that Van be given an early opportunity to attend the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, a virtual requirement for promotion to lieutenant colonel. To drive home his assessment of Van's talent, Palmer added a special letter of commendation to Van's file. You have been an outstanding company commander and all-around leader of men. Under your leadership, I have had the utmost confidence in Heavy Mortar Company to accomplish any mission assigned. On all occasions, Heavy Mortar Company has reflected the highly competitive, aggressive, and enthusiastic spirit which you have provided. I feel that much credit for the success of your company is due to your integrity, tenacity, and singleness of purpose. At the headquarters in Heidelberg, where Van joined the logistical management section of the G-4 division, his superiors were soon praising him with similar exuberance. I consider this officer to be one of the Army's outstanding young men, his immediate superior said on his first efficiency report. 
Van's private life did not affect the esteem in which his superiors held him. These superiors, Palmer among them, uniformly praised Van's high moral character on his efficiency reports. In professional terms, Van was a highly moral man. He believed wholeheartedly in the ideals of the American officer, in caring for his troops, in leading by example, in reporting honestly to those above him, because the fulfillment of those ideals was bound up with his sense of self-respect. The Army also does not concern itself with the private lives of its officers as long as the officer avoids scandal and his private life does not include such things as homosexuality, which can easily lead to blackmail. The frequent separations of military life tend to reduce adultery to the mere transaction on a couch that Napoleon claimed it to be. Those marriage partners who remain faithful, as Mary Jane did, do so because monogamy is an emotional preference or need. A number of Van's contemporaries knew of his off-duty activity, because he boasted of his sexual prowess. Most found his tales amusing or envied his virility. He also made appearance count in his favor. One of Van's friends at Schweinfurt noticed that although Van quickly acquired a bevy of German girlfriends, he was discreet. He never brought his girlfriends to the officers' club even before Mary Jane arrived, as some of the other officers who were away from their wives did. Van's superiors undoubtedly heard something about his extramarital activities through the grapevine. They could see that he was being careful and discretion was equivalent to personal morality in their set of values. Van also seemed to be an upright man in his other habits. He never drank to excess. In fact, he hardly drank at all. Nor did he run up debts. For her own reasons, Mary Jane did not betray him with tales or scenes outside the family. Life in Germany was much happier than she could have anticipated, after her ordeal in New Jersey. John's good mood at being in an overseas unit tended to make him give her a semblance of the marriage she wanted. He showed an interest in the children and on Sundays frequently took the family on bicycle trips along the dirt roads through the evergreen forests. Mary Jane would put the newest baby Peter, who was born at Heidelberg in November 1955, in the basket of her bicycle. John carried little Tommy in the basket of his bicycle and five-year-old Jesse rode in a seat on the back, Patricia, who became nine in the fall of, and John Allen, who became eight that Christmas, followed on their small bikes. Mary Jane packed a lunch, and she and John strapped badminton rackets and poles and a net to their bicycles to set up a game at a picnic clearing. Every six months or so, John went on leave and loaded the family into the car for a vacation. They drove to the Bavarian Alps on one occasion, toured Holland on another, and visited West Berlin, which bustled with a freedom that defied the Soviets, who kept it isolated. Patricia remembered that Christmas was always the best time of the year because her father made such a fuss about it. One year he even painted a panorama of Santa Claus and his reindeer across the picture window in the living room of their apartment in Patrick Henry Village, the army housing complex at Heidelberg. He insisted that they have a big tree and helped decorate it lavishly. A couple of days before Christmas, he bought everyone lots of presents at the PX. Mary Jane later told Patricia that he would not let her go along, that he wanted to do all of the Christmas shopping by himself. John and Mary Jane would wrap the presents after the children had gone to sleep on Christmas Eve. They would then rouse Patricia and her brothers at 4 a.m. or so and watch the children rush to the tree and whoop as they tore open their gifts. One afternoon in Heidelberg, when Mary Jane was home and Peter and Tommy were having their naps, the door buzzer sounded. She opened the door to a German girl who spoke English. The girl said that she wanted to speak to Mary Jane about a private matter. Mary Jane took her into the living room and offered her a cup of coffee. The girl's hand shook. She spilled some of the coffee on her dress as she tried to sip it. She started to sob and told Mary Jane a long tale of how John had seduced her by saying that he loved her and was going to divorce his wife and marry her. After a few weeks, he suddenly dropped her. He was having his secretary at the office tell her that he was out whenever she telephoned and he would not answer her letters pleading to see him. At first, she had not wanted to confront Mary Jane, the girl said. But then she had decided it was the only way to learn the truth. She was so much in love with John that she had to know. He had seemed so sincere, and that was why she had gone to bed with him. Was it true that he and Mary Jane no longer loved each other and were going to be divorced? Mary Jane felt pity for the girl. John had probably used this same technique on dozens of girls, she thought, for all she knew, perhaps hundreds, at the rate he went through women. 
She told the girl that she believed John still loved her in his own way and there had been no discussion of divorce. If there was, she would fight a divorce, she said. She advised the girl to be more careful with men in the future. Mary Jane gave her a handkerchief to blow her nose and wipe her eyes and said that she would have to leave now because the older children were about to return from school. The girl did not mention her age, but was clearly still in her late teens. John did not deny sleeping with her. He did deny that he had said he loved her and had promised to marry her. He had better learn to control himself, Mary Jane said, before he made some young woman pregnant or ran across one who raised a stink when he dropped her and he hurt his career and his family. He told Mary Jane to leave him alone, that he knew how to handle himself. His success in the G4 division at the Heidelberg headquarters was even grander than the acclaim he had won at the 16th Infantry. If Van's degree of energy and verve is rare in the world of the fighting soldier, it is that much rarer in the world of the quartermaster. Major Van is a virtual dynamo in getting work done, one of his superiors remarked on an efficiency report. It would take the production of three or four average officers to equal his daily work production anywhere, in an office, on a staff study, or in the field. Van's job in the logistical management section was to analyze the Army supply system in Europe and recommend improvements. He approached it, as he did all professional tasks, by seeking the basics. He got authorization to travel. He went to the depots and found out what they had in stock and how they were issuing their supplies. He went to the combat units and found out what they needed and whether they were receiving it. Major Van soon knew more than anyone else in the G4 Division of U.S. Army Europe about how the supply system was actually functioning. He wrote up his findings in reports that were simple and incisive in their reasoning, full of facts that were surprising because no one else had thought to look for them, and illustrated with statistical tables that complemented his logic instead of cluttering it. He presented a plan to reorganize the entire system and eliminate many of the bottlenecks and other shortcomings. His plan was accepted by the two-star general in charge of the G4 division and by the four-star commander of U.S. Army Europe. Van was appointed the action officer to implement his plan. The reorganization uncovered further problems. Van again won acceptance of his views on how to solve them and was once more put in charge of carrying out the solution. He was promoted to chief of the logistical management section and made the briefing officer for the G4 division. Whenever a civilian VIP or a touring general or admiral appeared in Heidelberg, Major Van got out on the high wire in the briefing room to dazzle the eminent visitor with what a remarkable job the G4 Division of U.S. Army Europe was doing. Wilbur Brooker, President Eisenhower's Secretary of the Army, came to the headquarters in July 1956 on an inspection trip. Major Van briefed him on supply operations in Europe. The G4 Division did work hard in those years of tension, and Van was, in any case, convinced its performance was exemplary because his own was so good. Brooker and the other visitors wrote letters of appreciation afterward that went into Van's file, and his grateful superiors saw to it that his other ACK accomplishments were also recorded for future promotion boards. He was twice sent as a special escort officer, with newly arrived generals on orientation tours of the units the generals were to command. The trips were a compliment to a young major. He advised the generals on what questions to ask and also on the usefulness of the answers. Van is an officer with a bright future ahead of him, Bruce Palmer had predicted. Major Van's future was bright indeed. He and Mary Jane and the children sailed home from Germany in the summer of 1957 for a long leave before he started classes in the fall at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. He had been selected to attend it that spring as he was nearing completion of his two years at Heidelberg. His superiors at Heidelberg gave him the highest possible efficiency rating, an outstanding officer of rare value to the service, equally adept at staff or command. He represents a great potential to the Army as a future leader of the Army. John Van fulfilled their expectations at Fort Leavenworth. His standing in the class there reflected the extent to which he had grown in his profession by diligence down through the years. He had graduated from the basic course at the infantry school in 1947 in the bottom half of his class. He had completed the advanced course there in 1952 in the upper 20 percent. He graduated from the nine-month course at the Command and General Staff College in June 1958 in the top 2 percent. 
11th out of 532 officers in his class. The college had to mail him his diploma. He and the family left a week before the graduation ceremony in a Volkswagen bus he had bought in Germany and drove east to Syracuse, New York, so that he could start the summer session at the university there. While at Heidelberg, he had agreed to a career specialty in logistics, because specialization was the most certain route to early promotion for an officer who was not a West Pointer. The Army had in turn approved his request for civilian postgraduate study at Syracuse University to obtain his master's degree in business administration. By early May 1959, he was within three months of his MBA. He had also crammed in enough additional courses in public administration so that he would leave Syracuse with two courses and a thesis left to do for a doctorate in that field. He planned to take the two courses and write the thesis in Washington. During a three- to four-year logistics staff assignment, he was scheduled to begin at the Pentagon in the summer of 1959. He wanted the civilian degrees for their own sake, but also because they would help him win accelerated promotion to lieutenant colonel and beyond. He did not intend to stay in logistics. It bored him on a steady basis. He intended to work his way to command of an infantry battalion as quickly as possible after he became a lieutenant colonel, turn in another of his spectacular performances, and by then be far enough ahead of his contemporaries to win further accelerated promotions within the infantry itself. His future was assured. He could see his stars. Then his other life caught up with him. An agent from the Criminal Investigation Division of the Military Police appeared in Syracuse on the morning of May 1959 and called Van Seven out of class. The agent informed him of his constitutional right not to incriminate himself, because he was going to be questioned about an accusation that could become a formal charge of statutory rape. He had been accused by another officer of having an affair with a 15-year-old girl while a student at Fort Leavenworth. Statutory rape is a felony under military law. If convicted, Van could be sentenced to 15 years in prison. Because of his record, a court-martial would most likely show mercy and dismiss him from the army. Dismissal for an officer is the equivalent of dishonorable discharge for an enlisted man. He would be ruined in civilian life as well, if that happened. Former soldiers with dishonorable discharges had a hard time finding decent low-level jobs in the pre-Vietnam atmosphere of the 1950s and early 60s. What business firm would hire a dishonored officer as an executive? Van was cagey. He said the agent's questions did not surprise him. The girl had told a chaplain at Fort Leavenworth that he had had an affair with her, he said. He had received a letter from the chaplain about it shortly after reaching Syracuse and had written back to say that it wasn't true. It was all a fantasy, he said. The girl was emotionally disturbed. At the agent's request, he signed and swore to a statement saying that he had not slept with her. Mary Jane was sewing when he came home in the afternoon. He told her the truth. When he told her who the girl was, she screamed and threw a box of buttons at him. The girl had done some babysitting for Mary Jane. She had been an overweight 15-year-old, not pretty, and emotionally withdrawn and unhappy with her family life. Men as sexually insecure as Van are sometimes drawn to girls like this. Mary Jane was already full of worry and didn't know how she was going to stand anymore. Peter had been in the hospital at Rome Air Force Base, 35 miles from Syracuse, for the last four months. Van had driven him there at Mary Jane's request for an examination in early January, about a month and a half after Peter's third birthday, because his skin had started to turn yellow. The doctor said he had hepatitis. He got worse in the hospital. He lost weight, and the skin all over his body became deeply jaundiced. The doctors didn't seem to know how to make him well. She and Van had been having terrible arguments over the boy's illness. He accused her of bringing on the hepatitis by neglecting Peter. She had become suspicious of the Air Force doctors and wanted to transfer Peter to a civilian hospital. The Rome unit was the only military hospital in the area. Government regulations required officers and enlisted men to pay for civilian medical treatment for themselves and their families if they chose it when military facilities were available. Van was unwilling to pay the possibly large sums involved. He said that the civilian doctors would not be any better. Three days after the appearance of the CID agent, the Air Force doctors decided to release Peter from the hospital. They claimed that his condition had stabilized, the weight loss had recently stopped, and the jaundice had diminished. Peter didn't look that much better to Mary Jane, but she was glad to get him away from the Air Force doctors. 
He wasn't home long before the jaundice returned in all of its gruesome hue and his stomach swelled up. Now Van also became alarmed for Peter and did not object when Mary Jane said she was taking the boy to Strong Memorial Hospital in Rochester, where she had been treated as a child. The doctors at Rochester confirmed the hepatitis diagnosis of the Air Force physicians and put Peter on the same cortisone medication with the same lack of success. By mid-June, Mary Jane was convinced that she was going to lose her son. With his swollen stomach and his spindly arms and legs sticking out from his body, Peter reminded her of child victims she had seen in photographs of Nazi concentration camps. Someone on the hospital staff at Rochester was also apparently convinced that Peter was going to die soon and tipped off an enterprising representative of a funeral home. He approached Van and Mary Jane while they were visiting one evening and asked if he could ease their burden. She went berserk and raved at the man. As angry as he was himself, Van had to restrain her. They drove Peter to the hospital at Syracuse University Medical School. The doctors there said that Peter might have a blood disorder, but they really didn't know what was wrong. Their advice was to take him to the Children's Hospital in Boston, the best pediatric medical center in the world. Van carried Peter out of the hospital wrapped in a blanket and laid him on the back seat of the car. He dropped Mary Jane off at the house to stay with the other children and drove straight through the night to Boston. He returned to Syracuse a day later and told her he had had a horrible experience getting Peter admitted to the children's hospital. When Van had walked in carrying Peter early in the morning, the clerk at the admissions desk had said the hospital services were in such demand that it could not take patients right off the street. Van needed an appointment to have one of the staff doctors examine his son. There were no beds available at the moment. The best the clerk could do was to put Peter on a waiting list. Van said he barged past the admissions desk and roamed the corridors with Peter in his arms until he found a doctor whom he talked into examining the boy. He told the doctor that he didn't care about the fees, that he would pay whatever the hospital wanted, just please save his son. The doctor said that Peter's chances did not appear good, but that he would do his best, and he arranged Peter's admission to the hospital. A bed opened up because another child who had been one of the doctor's patients had just died. Peter might need surgery to try to find out what was wrong with him, Van said. Mary Jane immediately closed down the house they were renting in Syracuse, sending the other children to her mother in Rochester and putting her furniture in storage, and moved into a rooming house in Boston to be with Peter. Van stayed in Syracuse to finish his courses. After a week of tests, the doctors at the Children's Hospital decided that exploratory surgery was necessary. Peter didn't have hepatitis. The cortisone the Air Force doctors and the civilian physicians at Strong Memorial had been giving him for this presumed liver infection had been aggravating the problem he did have. He also was not as close to death as he looked, but the condition from which he was suffering and continued mistreatment of it would eventually have killed him. The exploratory surgery revealed that a temporary disorder of the pancreas gland had caused an obstruction in the duct leading from the pancreas to the small intestine. The pancreas secretes an alkaline solution that is required for the digestive process. The disordered pancreas and the obstructed duct had in turn caused all sorts of other abnormalities, including a malfunctioning liver. Peter's body was in such disarray that he had the highest cholesterol count in the history of the children's hospital. The surgeon who did the exploratory work and diagnosed the problem also removed the obstruction in the same operation and sent Peter back to his bed, a child ready to mend. The hospital released him in the first part of July, two weeks after the surgery, although Peter was to be many months recovering fully. Van came down and picked up Mary Jane and his son and drove them to her parents. The story of how Van saved Peter's life by begging a doctor at the children's hospital to accept him became part of the family lore. Peter thought of it as he stood beside the grave at Arlington and the chaplain handed him the folded flag from the coffin. Van did save his son's life by acting immediately on the advice of the Syracuse University doctors. Mary Jane had also saved the boy by goading Van into letting her take Peter to civilian hospitals. The truth was that Van hadn't had any difficulty getting Peter admitted in Boston. The children's hospital never turns away a child in need of care. The pediatrician on duty in the hospital's emergency room when Van arrived had examined Peter and ordered him admitted, and a staff pediatrician and a surgeon had been assigned to his case. Van had invented the drama because he wanted Mary Jane to think well of him at a time when she had reason to think otherwise. 
The CID had been pressing ahead with its investigation. Agents checked details of the girl's story that could be independently verified, such as a claim that she had visited a doctor in Leavenworth, Kansas, the garrison town next to the fort, at one point in the affair when she had feared she was pregnant. The details checked out. The girl agreed to be questioned about her story with a lie detector. The machine said that she was telling the truth. The CID agents offered Van an opportunity to take a lie detector test to confirm his denials. He refused. When he received his MBA from Syracuse University at the end of July, he was kept in a holding pattern instead of being sent to the Pentagon as scheduled. Two weeks later, the CID submitted a lengthy report recommending that he be court-martialed for statutory rape and adultery. The adultery charge was a misdemeanor tossed in to buttress the felony count. It was taken from the catch-all article of military law that forbids conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman. Mary Jane, who had not been questioned by the agents, was listed as the victim under the adultery charge. First Army Headquarters, then at Fort J, New York, appointed an officer to conduct a second investigation known as an article seating, the equivalent of the grand jury process in civilian law. If the investigating officer found that there was sufficient evidence to convict, Van would be formally charged and court-martialed. Until his fate could be decided, he was assigned as deputy comptroller at Camp Drum, later Fort Drum, then a training base for reservists and National Guardsmen in the snow belt of northern New York State off Lake Ontario. He rented the first floor of a large farmhouse in a hamlet near the post for Mary Jane and the children. Van knew that Mary Jane would lie for him. She had rallied to him after her initial anger had passed and out of gratitude for what he had done for Peter. She had also seen the threat from the beginning as directed as much at her and the children as at him. What kind of a future would she and the children have with John in prison or ruined? With her potential role as a corroborating witness in mind, he had already created a framework in which she could lie effectively for him. Prior to another interrogation by a CID agent at Fort J in mid-July, he composed a story of befriending an emotionally disturbed girl who expressed her unhappiness at her home life by having affairs with older men. The girl happened to tell him of her troubles because he was willing to listen. He did not inform her parents because she confided in him and asked him not to betray her. He implied that her parents were too insensitive to understand in any case. In her depression, the girl finally turned on him too and falsely claimed to the chaplain that he was having an affair with her. The agent at Fort J asked him to write down his story. He did so in a 17-page account in longhand. The story was filled with incidents that Mary Jane could witness. In one incident, Mary Jane overheard the girl talking to one of her adult lovers on the van's phone. Van instructed his wife not to let the girl use the phone anymore. He disposed of incidents from the girl's story like the visit to the doctor in Leavenworth. The CID had questioned him about this and other details of her account. By writing that the girl's mother had asked Mary Jane for the name of a gynecologist for her daughter. The lie detector seemed a more formidable obstacle to him. Mary Jane's testimony would be viewed with suspicion. In order to cast serious doubt on the girl's veracity, he would eventually have to accept the CID's challenge and submit to a lie detector test. Then he would have to fool the machine. After the Article 32 investigation began in August, the regulations entitled him to divert to his defense what time he wished from his duty as Deputy Comptroller at Camp Drum. He gathered all of the technical literature he could and turned himself into an amateur specialist on the polygraph, the most common form of lie detector and the type that is used by the investigative branches of the military services, the CIA, and other government agencies. The polygraph measures blood pressure, pulse, breathing, and perspiration of the hands. It detects lying if a pattern of change in these vital signs occurs under the emotional tension of trying to deceive. Van finagled tranquilizers and drugs to lower blood pressure. He bought a physician's instrument for measuring blood pressure. He timed the rate of his pulse beats with his watch. He drew up lists of questions about his affair with the girl. He arranged the questions in the sequence he believed a polygraph operator would follow. He put himself through mock interrogations, changing the questions and the sequence from one interrogation to another so that he would not be surprised. He interrogated himself with and without the various medications. He took notes on his bodily reactions. 
he finally decided that he seemed best able to slow down his reactions and not run the risk of appearing to have or drugged himself, simply by staying awake for 48 hours and answering the questions in a confident manner. On the day she appeared before the officer conducting the Article 32 investigation, Mary Jane wore a tweed skirt with a blouse and jacket. The fall had come by then, and she knew the outfit made her look her most attractive. The investigating officer was probably also a family man, she thought. He would see that she was a respectable woman and might be tempted to believe her. Although she did not reveal it, showing only a superficial nervousness, she was filled with dread as she put her hand on the Bible and swore to tell the truth. Unlike Van, she was religious. The Bible gave her emotional comfort during the most trying periods in the marriage. During the worst of Peter's illness, she had read the Bible several times every day and at night when she prayed for him to live. She hoped that this blasphemy would be understood and forgiven. She answered the questions as John had rehearsed her to do, corroborating the events in his story. She also told the investigating officer on her own that she and John loved each other and had a happy marriage. Van then volunteered to take the lie detector test. He fooled the machine. Like a civilian jury, a group of officers sitting on a court-martial must find that the accused is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Van's success at beating the lie detector brought the case down to his word against the girls. No court-martial would convict on that basis. The investigating officer recommended dropping the charges. First Army Headquarters took until mid-December to concur in the finding of the investigating officer. The snow and the cold that blew off Lake Ontario were hard on Mary Jane. She developed a cough and went to the dispensary at Camp Drum after she started spitting up blood, too. The tests showed that she had tuberculosis. The afternoon they received the news that the charges had been dropped was a warm day for a change. Mary Jane went for a walk with John down the road from the farmhouse, the packed snow soft under their feet from the sun. He talked on and on about how relieved he was. He was ready to do backflips in the snow he was so happy over his victory. I guess you've learned your lesson now, she said. I sure as hell have, he said. Next time I'll make goddamn sure they're old enough. John Van was assigned to the Army's Anti-Aircraft Missile Center at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas, as chief of the program and budget section in the comptroller's office. He resumed his lifestyle in El Paso, and the marriage took another of its turns for the worse. At the office, Van always appeared enthusiastic, and he received superlative efficiency reports. Privately, he was desperate with boredom over his work as a super accountant. He had never complained to Mary Jane before about his army job. He complained now. He felt doubly trapped, first by the army bureaucracy he had thought he was outwitting in agreeing to specialize in logistics so that he could obtain graduate degrees and accelerated promotions, and second by this woman and her children. Although he was never to know it, Mary Jane did snare him into the two years and two months he was to spend in El Paso. A friend in Army personnel at the Pentagon had telephoned while they were still awaiting the outcome of the Article 32 investigation and asked if there was anything he could do. Mary Jane described how the Lake Ontario weather was destroying her health. If the charges against John were dropped, would the friend please not give him any choice in his next assignment and send him directly to a warm and dry climate? The friend, who understood the circumstances of the Van's marriage, said that her wish would be granted. Van won early promotion to lieutenant colonel in May 1961, and he knew that he could also look forward to receiving the eagles of a full colonel ahead of his contemporaries. No matter how superlatively he performed in the future, he would always be held back from the leap to general if any mention of the statutory rape charge existed in his records. There are more candidates for stars than stars to give, and the army does not want its generals to have personal habits that could cause unsharture scandal. A promotion board for general officers would feel obliged to hold to the opposite standard of court-martial. The possibility of guilt would suffice to condemn him to rejection. Nevertheless, he tried to salvage his career. One of his former superiors in Germany sent him to a mutual acquaintance who had recently retired from the army to join a missile division of Martin Marietta. The acquaintance was Colonel Francis Bradley, who was subsequently to become one of the leading executives of the weapons and aerospace firm. He was a close friend of Van's former superior and had also met Van briefly in Germany. Frank Bradley's last job in the Army had been as an assistant in the Chief of Staff's office. He still had good connections there. 
When Van came to see him and told his story, Bradley was struck by his lack of guilt at having slept with the girl. His regrets were confined to getting caught and spoiling his career. He boasted to Bradley of how he had fooled the lie detector. Van said that unless he could make the evidence of the scandal disappear, he was going to leave the Army in 1963 when he reached 20 years of service and could retire on half pay. He asked Bradley to arrange for him to see his entire personnel file in a room at the Pentagon where he could be alone. He did not say that he intended to steal the records of the CID investigation and the Article 32 proceeding, but his implication was as open as the rest of his conversation. Bradley put Van off with a vague reply. Van and Bradley met again in El Paso in early 1962 as Bradley was passing through there on business. Van was preparing to go to Vietnam. He reiterated his intention to retire. Bradley was impressed with what he had previously heard of Van's talent, and he trusted the praise of Van's former superior in Germany. He was also a forgiving man about the personal habits of others. Bradley offered Van a job with Martin Marietta, and Van said that he was interested. Less than two months later, John Van walked through the swinging doors of Dan Porter's office in Saigon to start his first year in Vietnam, to struggle with Huynh Van Cao and the other straw men of DM's army, to meet his Viet Cong enemy at back, to try to prevent the defeat of the Saigon side and the calamity of a big American war by fighting the battle of truth with Paul Harkins and Victor Krulak and Maxwell Taylor, and to cope with the arrogance and professional corruption of the American military system of the 1960s. A man like John Van might well have sacrificed a career to fight that larger battle. A might well have is still an uncertainty. The only certainty is that Van fought that battle in the luxury of believing his career was already lost, and he was decorated for conspicuous moral gallantry while deceiving Halberstam and me and all his other admirers. In the early fall of 1962, before Cow had begun to systematically fake operations against the guerrillas and when Van was still Harkins's star advisor, he wrote Frank Bradley to confirm that he planned to retire in the coming year. In May 1963, shortly after his return to the United States, Van flew to Denver for an interview at Martin Marietta's main aerospace complex. He accepted a position as the executive in charge of sales presentations. At the end of May, just as Van was beginning his briefing campaign at the Pentagon to warn of the disaster that Harkins was brewing in Vietnam, he submitted a formal request to be retired on July 31, 1963. When Taylor canceled his scheduled briefing for the Joint Chiefs on July 8, he had three weeks left on active duty. In Denver, Van had barely started his intended climb to the top in the world of industry when he realized what a terrible mistake he had made in leaving the Army. Permanent consignment to second place in the Army was superior to anything he could attain in business. There were no stars to be won in the business world. What happened in business really didn't matter. Bob York, who had recently been promoted to Major General, wrote from Vietnam just before Christmas 1963 to say that he was coming home to take charge of the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Not knowing the true reason, York had been sickened at the loss to the Army when he had heard of Van's retirement. He offered Van command of a battalion in the 82nd if he would return to the service. Van was overjoyed. The Army wouldn't let him return. The general in charge of officer personnel at the Pentagon told York that he would not request Van's recall to active duty because he knew that Taylor or McNamara would disapprove. Van appealed to Bruce Palmer, by then a major general senior to York. He could not help either. Outwardly, John Van was an active and successful man. His progress at Martin Marietta was steady, and he went into politics, leading the Colorado movement to draft Henry Cabot Lodge as the Republican presidential candidate in 1964 and then organizing Republican support for Lyndon Johnson after Barry Goldwater became the candidate and split the party. When he was not occupied with business or politics, Van was traveling to lecture or do newspaper and television interviews on the war in Vietnam. He gave scores of lectures and interviews on Vietnam all over the country between his retirement in mid-1963 and the end of 1964. Inwardly, Van was a man being crushed by the boredom of his job and by the concerns of Mary Jane and the children. She was an embittered woman by now, and she took out her bitterness in constant squabbles with him. He avoided the house he had bought for the family in Littleton, a Denver suburb near the Martin Marietta plant, as much as he could leaving early in the morning and not returning until late at night. 
Mary Jane remarked to him one day that the marriage certainly must be finished when he wouldn't eat her cooking anymore. Yeah, he said. You're right. In the summer of 1964, after the failure of another attempt by York to persuade the Army to let him return, Van approached officials at the Far East Bureau of the Agency for International Development in Washington. The White House had assigned AID principal responsibility for the civilian pacification program in Vietnam, and the agency was having trouble recruiting men for the work. Most of its career economic development officers were unsuited to the tasks involved. Many of them also did not want to live apart from their families and get shot at in the Vietnamese countryside. AID was therefore starting to turn toward retired military officers as the most logical source of manpower. The officials at the Far East Bureau were delighted at the prospect of a man with Van's experience and talent. At the moment, like almost all Washington agencies every fourth year, AID was in a holding pattern until after the presidential election. Van was told to come back in November if he was still interested. He did, as soon as he had finished making his small contribution to the landslide defeat of Goldwater, and was offered the post of Regional Director of Pacification for the Mekong Delta. He accepted and flew home to tell Mary Jane, I will never live with you again. Maxwell Taylor, who had resigned the chairmanship of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in mid-1964 to replace Lodge as the ambassador in Saigon, vetoed the appointment. A cable from the embassy informed A.I. that Van was too controversial. Van offered to go as a simple province pacification representative. The embassy replied that Van was not wanted in any capacity. He said that he would go to Thailand where a minor insurgency was then underway if he couldn't go to Vietnam. The officials at the Far East Bureau said they would think about his offer. Mary Jane realized that he had to return to Vietnam for his own survival. She had never seen him as despondent as he became during the winter of 1964-65. He took to the bed, as the old Southern expression has it. He lay on the couch in the living room for hours at night and on weekends, staring at nothing. He no longer walked the way her John had always done, swinging a leg forward as he strode into life. He walked more slowly that winter and let his head droop. He was, she could see, losing his self-respect and his faith in himself. As usual, he did not give up entirely. He appealed to Lodge and York to intervene for him. He persuaded the officials at the Far East Bureau to ask Taylor to reconsider. He even wrote Taylor a friendly letter describing his efforts to maintain public support for the war, with his lectures and interviews on Vietnam. He was rescued by a fellow Virginian who admired him, the Sam Wilson who had heard Churchill's voice over the farmhouse radio in 1940, defying the Nazis, and walked seven miles through the rain to join the National Guard. Twenty-five years later, Wilson was an Army colonel in Vietnam, detailed to AID as chief of its pacification program. He had been Lansdale's assistant at the Pentagon during Van's briefing campaign there in 1963. Wilson had been amazed then by the brilliance of Van's critique, and the two men had immediately liked each other. He did not learn Van was attempting to return to Vietnam until he saw a copy of the message from the Far East Bureau asking Taylor to reconsider. Wilson went to Taylor and said they could not afford to reject a man of Van's qualities. Taylor relented. Van could come as an ordinary province pacification officer. Van had a cruel encounter with his youth just before he left. While in Washington in February and March for three weeks of processing and orientation lectures at AID headquarters, he stayed with Garland Hopkins at Hopkins's house in the Virginia suburb of McLean. Hopkins had been destroyed by his pedophilia. The CIA had fired him as head of the American Friends of the Middle East, the pro-Arab lobby that he had built, and that the CIA secretly funded. He had then been dismissed as pastor of a prominent church in Arlington, and also removed from the Virginia Conference of Methodist Ministers, in which his father and grandfather had held honored places. His wife had divorced him because he had taken to beating her and their youngest son under the stress of his disgrace. He still could not control his obsession and molested some boys in his neighborhood. The parents complained to the police, and this time he was going to be prosecuted. He could not bear the shame. He wrote out his will and an obituary listing his accomplishments. He also wrote a note to Van, and then he took a rat poison containing strychnine, inflicting a painful death on himself. Strychnine kills with convulsions. Van found Hopkins's body when he returned to the house on a Sunday night. 
The note asked Van to distribute the obituary to the newspapers, listed family members and friends for Van to notify, and also asked him to see to it that Hopkins's body was cremated. Van called the police and then did as his boyhood mentor asked. Let these few chores be a last token of our long and splendid friendship, the note said. The horror of it made Van more eager than ever to be gone. Martin Marietta put him on a leave of absence because his aid appointment was a temporary one. Washington did not expect the war to last long. His conscience was clear about Mary Jane and the children. He had them settled in the house in Littleton, and his contract with A.I. had entitled him to fly home once a year at government expense to visit them for 30 days. He took the Pan American jet west out of San Francisco along the route that the nation had followed into Asia in the previous century to Honolulu, to Guam, then to Manila, and then on to Saigon, this new and contested place. Shortly after 11 a.m. on Saturday, March 20, 1965, his plane circled high over the city and then banked down sharply to the runway at Tan San Nut to avoid the guerrilla snipers who were now all around Saigon. He walked out of the air-conditioned cabin and down the ramp into the heat and humidity, which were at their worst just before the monsoon season. The discomfort felt good to him. He had been gone almost two years, 23 months and two weeks. He would never be away from the war that long again. He was back in Vietnam where he belonged.